speak the charm of make charm of make charm of make charm of make charm there will come a time on the planet earth when science and technology will be long forgotten when wizards will rule the world this is the Arnamancy podcast exploring esotericism tarot magic and the occult i I'm Reverend Eric. Welcome back to the Arnamancy Podcast. This is Eric Arneson, and my host today is Douglas Batcher, Bachelor, a magician and the host of the What Magic Is This podcast. Uh, he says he's got about 16 years of experience with the cult, and then the occult, and then he also calls himself a late bloomer. So I don't know totally what that means, but uh, we'll we'll find out more when we get into this. Um, we are going to be discussing uh, Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa's fourth book of occult philosophy in this episode, uh, and this is sort of a the second part of an episode that, um, or the second part of a series of episodes that we started on his podcast, where we did a really deep dive on who Agrippa is, and the third book of occult philosophy. Uh, so before we get into the interview, I just have to make a couple of announcements. First, my introduction to sigils class. Uh, there's another, the, it's still available. It's happening, I think, tomorrow. Uh, I mean, it, relative to when this podcast should come out. Not tomorrow, like for us right now. So that would be ridiculous. Um, <laughs> and then also, I ha- I'm i in a new book called A Specialized... Oh, I'm going to get the name wrong. Anyhow, it's a book. It's a book about tarot. And it's a bunch of tarot spreads, and there's a bunch of uh, contributors from uh, from around the world who are in it. And uh, you can find that for sale on my website. So go check that out. Okay, thanks for putting up with that, Douglas. Uh, thanks for being on my podcast. <laughs> no worries, it's my my absolute pleasure. It's been uh, it's been a while coming. It's a bit of a gap between when we recorded the uh, the first Agrippa episode and this one. But uh, truth be told, I'm actually looking forward to this episode more than I was uh, to record the one that uh, that we we did on mine. I mean, because we're going to be talking about something that I really want to talk about. So thank you so much for having me, Eric. Oh, it's my pleasure. And, you know, honestly, we needed to have the gap because I kind of had to reread the fourth book and kind of find some stuff to talk about. It's an interesting one. Um, T-Bop, as we now we now T- have to yeah, call it. Yeah, T-Bop. T-Bop. <laughs> Three books of occult philosophy. So. Right. So, <laughs> if, keep, so, if people are wondering what we're talking about when we say T-Bop, that is, that is it. So, so then that would make this F-Bop. F-Bop. This is F-Bop. Yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> uh, so so T-Bop is huge. T-Bop is yeah. uh, three rather substantial books. It kind of covers everything from natural magic to... It covers everything. It covers everything, I think, everything, that Agrippa... Everything's could, in there. Yeah. And so, so the fourth book is interesting in that it's kind of a collection of stuff. Um, mm-hmm. And it's obviously not all by Agrippa. Like, some sections actually have other people's names associated with them. But uh, and this one came out um, after Agrippa died or vanished. Tw- Twenty four years after Agrippa passed away, apparently. Yeah, and yeah. his student, um, it was main student, the guy that is sort of like henchman, <laughs> claimed mm-hmm. that Agrippa had nothing to do with this book. Yes. So for probably some interesting reasons that we might get into. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's always had the the authorship of this book. It's been spurious, but I mean, well, I mean, the authorship of specifically one part of the book called "On Magical Ceremony," which is uh, is very short, but uh, it's attributed to Agrippa. A lot of people put the word "pseudo Agrippa" on there, but uh, it's my contention that I think he definitely wrote the book. I feel like even if it's not somebody, if it wasn't Agrippa, it was definitely somebody who is familiar with his material because whoever one wrote, yeah, whoever wrote that, other students, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Whoever wrote that section refers to T-Bop as my three books. Um, And there's not a lot of overlap. It's almost like, it almost feels like Agrippa wrote uh, the three books and they got out there, maybe in manuscript form, and people were like, man, these books are great. They've got all this stuff in them, but how do you do these things? And Agrippa was like, oh, shit, I forgot that chapter. (laughs) Um, And I I really like it because it's kind of... uh, you know, it is instructions. They're, they're sort of genericized instructions um, for 
uh, there's some stuff that's kind of uh, overlap, you know, like he talks about computing the names of spirits or calculating the names of spirits, good yeah. and evil. He talks about how to create their signs. And both of those right. are things that he had already covered in, uh, in T-Bop. But, uh, mm-hmm. and these are sort of like additional sections. But then he has whole stuff about like, here's how you set up a magic circle. Here's how you consecrate things. Here's what you wear. Here's how you do all of this stuff. So it's almost like, it's almost it really sort of feels like the the companion piece for okay you've read the three books of occult philosophy you've learned all of this stuff here's how you put it into practice yeah the uh, the interesting thing that uh, that we have from some of Agrippa's letters uh, towards the end of his life uh, if if people aren't familiar with Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa yet uh, might want to refer back to my the episode I recorded a couple of weeks ago just Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa uh, is that he disappeared kind of in 1533. We didn't hear anything about him. Uh, one of his students, Johann Weyer, uh, who we will talk about, says that he died in uh, 1535. But towards the end of his life, he had letters where he said, I have the keystone to everything. I have the ultimate secret to to my three books, the thing that will tie it all together. And, and in his letters, the responses were like, when are you going to release this? When are you going to release this? He goes missing. It's just like, boop, entirely gone. 24 years after this uh, essay, well, the book uh, in Marburg in, I believe, uh, it's 1555. And it was published for the first time in Latin. He uh, it comes out on magical ceremonies by Agrippa is in there, and one of his students again, Wire, is basically said that there's no way that he wrote this, although he wrote a lot. So I don't really know. And no, what's strange is that not a lot of other things pseudo Agrippa came out after this time. Uh, I think that there's a very short period of time, the 24 years, has a lot to say about the fact that Agrippa probably wrote this, and maybe this is actually his. He did think that he had the ultimate uh, way of unlocking the rest of his work, and which would be the book on magical ceremonies. So for that, that for me is like an incredibly interesting part of this book. Yeah, I guess uh, th- that does make it super interesting. I, and I think another thing that um, I love about that on magical ceremonies section is he has parts in there that are almost kind of pseudo Solomonic. You know. Um, it, but it's um, it's the sort of thing that like if if all of these grimoires are valid grimoires, this is something that really needs to be paid attention to by the grimoire purists because it, there's a lot more stuff that's way more free form. You know, he's not as strict about things. He talks about consecrating stuff, but he doesn't give like pages and pages and pages of specific prayers. He talks about. Um, he talks about like you know the, like the Liber Spiritum. He's like, here's mm-hmm. the Liber Spiritum. Here's what you do. This is how you record all the spirits that you contact. But also, here's another way you can do it. You know, so he he right. he's he's really honest about like uh, he, he. It almost sounds like he's not he's not preaching dogma. He's sort of saying this is uh, one way to do it, and it worked for me. But you know, go try it out yourself. Even when he talks about, you know, the, the spirit contact stuff and he's got like the lamen that you're supposed to wear around his your neck. Right. And he, he has two instructions for that, like one of them. And, and they're kind of vague even there. He's sort of like, you know, just sort of make it up, put the spirit's name in a in a in a hexagram and, you know, his sign in there and then draw a bunch of five pointed stars around it. Right. <laughs> and then he's like, or you can just make a generic one that you wear for every spirit. It doesn't really matter. Do one or the other. And he even says stuff like, you can just put it on paper, use some colorful ink, you'll be good. <laughs> yeah. No, um, I, and that's, I think, one of the things that is incredibly attractive uh, about this book to me is we, I'm, I'm not sure if uh, people were aware, but we're kind of, we were kind of in, I think we're still kind of in it, it was called the Grimoire Renaissance, in which for a long period of time after Aleister Crowley said that, oh, the spirits are just in your brain, which kind of killed absolutely everything. Uh, sorry, Crowley, you're wrong. <laughs> uh, in, in about the uh, the early 21st uh, century, we had a lot of people re-examining these texts, people like Stephen Skinner, people like Joseph H. Peterson, Jake Stratton Kent, Michael Cicitelli, uh, and we, we have this this new understanding of the importance of grimoires. It is Jake Stratton Kent's uh, 
contention that no, no, grimoires are, are capital A, capital R, capital E, the Western magical tradition. And so we had this kind of strange thing where people were saying, well, you have to stick to the grimoires. The things that are in the grimoires, if you're going to do uh, the, the Ars Goisha, you have to have a lion skin belt. Who the fuck has a lion skin belt, right? And this kind of stuff. What I love about the fourth book, because it was such a monumental book at its time, there's, there's some evidence that it was actually probably recopied and printed more than T-Bob was. Um, that's something we might talk about in a little bit. But the fact that this book is so broad and kind of just basically saying that, look, there's a way to do it. It doesn't have to be overly specific, but you should probably try and do these things. As long as you kind of stay within the borders, there's room for adaptation and there's room for growth. And that to me is like one of those things where why aren't people reading this book and taking this book more seriously that are trying to be the goetic, um, I would say like fundamentalist that you have to stick to everything in the book. This is the book that's kind of the, the, the solve for that kind of thinking, which is for me is an incredibly admirable thing. So I, I have a ridiculous amount of respect for this book and the way that it sets out uh, kind of the order of, of how to do an invocation of a spirit. You have the, uh, the consecration die, which is the, uh, the consecrating of the, the circle and, and setting things up and getting things ready to do a invocation. You have the invocatio, which is the invocation itself. The, the things you say to adjure the spirit to kind of come to the, uh, or, or try to beckon the spirit to come to you. Then you have the uh, conscriptio, which is the, what do you know if the spirit is in the room with you? How, do, how will you know? How will you know that it's there? How will you communicate? You have the uh, legatio, which is the binding. Now that you have the spirit, you get him to concentrate on the things that uh, that you want the spirit to do so that later on, if you want to call on the spirit, it's not going to take as long. And then you have the licentia, which is the license to depart kind of thing. And that's all in fourth book. And, it, and it's very, very short when he's doing this, but it just makes sense. And then from there, if you read the fourth book, you just like, as long as I've got those five things in place, I'm pretty much good to go. And the tradition of grimoire magic and uh, what is goetic magic or Solomonic magic or ceremonial magic or whatever you want to call it, as long as you kind of have those things in place, there is a ton of room for adaptation and there's a ton of room to be able to kind of add your own thing. Did it work? Did it not work? Mm, Okay, maybe move on to something else. Try and see if that works. I wish people realized more kind of how the how loose the fourth book is with the fundamentals of Solomonic magic, Goetic magic, uh, Grimoire magic, this kind of thing. So that's, again, this is why I deeply, deeply respect this book. It's, and it's fantastic. And it's specifically on magical ceremonies, which is, oh, yeah. yeah, that's that well, stuff is my jam. And uh, some of the interesting stuff that's in there, for instance, is uh, there is even sort of this implication that, like, you know, you can just call a spirit at random and see what shows up. And then it has right. this like whole catalog of images. Like, you know, if your spirit right. has eagle legs, but like the head of an ox, it's probably from over here. Or, you know, it, it has like, it has images that, or sort of compounds of images that sort of can give you hints to the nature of the spirit. Um, yes. So, so Saturn there's. Saturnine spirits have this. Sat- like, mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's, it's really quite wonderful. Yeah. And so, w- but that's also um, kind of uh, far more open than you see in either the Solomonic or Goetic traditions where you have catalogs and you're like, here are the only spirits you can call. And this is their exact, um, you know, role, their exact, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's almost sort of, I think one of the reasons it doesn't get in a lot of attention is it's very free form. There's a lot of, Mm -hmm. there, there are no, uh, there are no real boundaries here. A grip is totally like it's big out there. Who the hell knows what you're going to run into, but here are some things that might help you out. Right. And I, I like that. No, nope. there's also, I, know, I absolutely love it. Yeah. There's also this uh, element about preparing for the right, which involves stuff like lots of fasting and even mm-hmm. spinning around in a circle until you get really dizzy, which yeah. to me is sort of like, okay, he's, he, he wants an altered state of consciousness Correct. Uh, not necessarily done through like chanting and trance work, but he wants it like he wants it kind of crazy, which, yeah. <laughs> which could even be an indicator that um, some of the spirit work might be best pursued with like entheogens or uh, drugs, you know, drugs that maybe Agrippa wouldn't have had access to or 
you know, I mean, he, of course, was really well versed in uh, iatro chemistry and herbs and shit. So he would have had access to lots of stuff that could fuck him up. But he, it's almost sort of like, well, maybe we should just get dizzy instead. Let's just spin in circles. <laughs> I love it. No, it's, it's quite wonderful. <laughs> um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, sort of the rest of the stuff. So so that, mm-hmm. uh, the, the On Magical Ceremonies is um, is just one of like, what is it, six different books in this thing? Yeah, and six, it's, six different books, yeah. Yeah, and it's kind of short. And so the rest of the, the rest of the, uh, of the, the fourth book consists of a couple of uh, pretty well, of a couple of grimoires that are pretty well known in their own right. The, uh, heptameron um the mm-hmm. arbitel uh and then it sort of departs from the spirit stuff a lot and dives into uh geomancy uh and a little bit of uh astrology or at least how astrology relates to geomancy but then there's right. this fascinating book uh the <laughs> the, the isagog yeah. right which is um written as a dialogue between castor and pollux uh speaking on the nature of spirits and right. Uh, and even that, so so you you know something about the supposed author of the Isagog who was kind yeah. of a dick. Can you tell oh, us? Oh, he wasn't him? just a dick. He wasn't just a dick. He was a real piece of work. His name was George uh, Pictoris Viliangus, and he was uh, he was a German physician, and he he basically thought that almost in the kind of Southern Baptist evangelical way that, that witches are taking over the world and that they are going to kill us all unless we do something about it. And, and he wrote Isagog as kind of a way of maybe I, I, I'm trying to think of why he would write it the way that he did, because when I reread it a couple of days ago, it was just like, I think he had a respect for Agrippa and he was trying to protect Agrippa from the idea that the, I, the thoughts put forward in t were specifically when he talked about demons, weren't demonic. And so, uh, George or Georg or George, who knows what it is. Um, it's George without an E. He snuck in some stuff in a synagogue specifically between the conversation between uh, Castor and Pollux and basically saying that, look, the word demon is actually the Greek word demon and that these things aren't demonic, uh, but though there are real demonic demon devil things, they're the Greek thing. So they're more like genius or divine inspiration. And maybe that's kind of what the group is talking about when he's talking about the demons kind of stuff. Um, but um, Billy Angus, he he was one of those people that just saw evil everywhere. And this is a kind of, I was thinking about this the other day, the period of time, the 16th century and less so in the 17th, but still private present in the 17th century. I don't know if we can even imagine just how out of flux everything was. And as an interesting experiment is go to any major a uh, city within North America or even in Europe, just any major city basically, and walk around and um, look at all the people around you and wonder how many of them would have been in the 16th century viewed as being witch or being demonic in some way. People going through uh, drug withdrawal or on drugs or just clear mental illness issues. Um, this is a strange experiment. You, so you can imagine how back in the day that this kind of thing would have been viewed as people that are in the throes of the devil's grip. And so George basically said, let's burn them all. Let's get rid of them all. These are all demonic people. And the key to kind of why the book is, is not being, or is not viewed as being written by Agrippa is because of Agrippa's student, Johann Weyer. Johann Weyer, incredibly interesting guy. He wrote the prestigious uh, Daemonum. In the appendix to that is Pseudomonarchia Daemonum. And he basically, Johann Weyer basically was one of the first people to say like the people that are being accused of being witches and being burned of being witches, they probably have mental health issues. 
which is incredibly cool. I have a great respect for Johan Weyer. So you could see how his idea of what constitutes a wish, a witch, greatly differed with that of George Villiangus. And it's because the fact that this book, Isagog, was included in the four books of occult philosophy that um, is maybe, I think, the major reason why Weyer basically said, uh, this is not written by Agrippa. I don't understand. Like this, this is total. I don't want him to be associated. Is that his hatred of the way that George saw witches was totally different than the way that Johann Weyer did, and he just didn't want to ed- have anything to do with it. So it's an interesting, it's an interesting book. Specifically, if you want to see or, or the part of the book, I suppose, if if you want to see kind of how, yeah, maybe demons are not the devil or that bad or this other thing that the Greeks were talking about yeah. kind of thing but uh, yeah but it, it even then it, it has um, <clears throat> for instance uh, this platonic division of spirits right where yes. where the Isagog talks about uh Plato dividing the uh, the orders of spirits into three degrees uh, where you have like um the untouchable spirits that are beyond our command. You have uh, like rational minds which have an airy quality and they wander up and down and are controlled by the moon or exist under the moon. You've got like um, uh, divine spirits or spirits like really closely attached to deity. But but it's just great because there's also uh, again you get this sense of uh, uncertainty. You know Castor and Pollux as they go along they kind of switch roles every once in a while in, in terms of like who's asking the questions, but they right. don't really um, come to any like really hard conclusions. They still leave a lot of questions open like this. This requires more examination and more uh, experimentation. And um, and he even talks a little bit, a bit about uh, subterranean spirits and lying spirits and they've got some great like weird little ghost stories sort of stuck in there where there's one that I really loved where I was reading it and I was like what the hell he talks about a, a <laughs> spirit uh, at Tumigen which is a, a city in Germany that um, apparently devoured a whole chariot and the horses that were attached to it uh, you betcha yeah that sounds like a big meal um <laughs> But, and also he talks about uh, uh, Hechelberg, which is a mountain in Norway that is supposedly haunted. Um, and I just love these sorts of weird little anecdotes that are shoved in there. You get uh, you get some real flavor where where uh, where Georg was like, here are some things that I don't know how to explain, so neither do my characters, and we're not going to make any like wild claims about these. There are wild claims, but um, but it's still just like it it leaves so many questions open it shows somebody who was definitely a practitioner and probably had access to lots of like weird grimoires and strange books just like agrippa did who still is not uh willing to say i have an exact idea of what these things are and everybody should listen to me he's really saying like these are these should be open to further investigation and interpretation and experimentation you know he's not um He's not laying down dogma so much. There's a little bit of it, but but there's a lot a of like bit, yeah. open-ended stuff. I forget the name of the book that uh, George Villianus wrote towards the end of his life. The one that he's most known for, which is just basically like burn all the witches. I yeah. totally forget the name. But um, yeah, Isagog is actually pretty reserved in his hatred for, for witches, which is, makes it an incredibly interesting document. And what you say about him being a little bit unsure is is, is very on point because wire was totally convinced that people that are called witches or that practice the magic stuff there's something wrong with them there's something actually physically scientifically wrong with them and that was that was his contention till the very end so mm-hmm. yeah no I, I, i've always enjoyed isagog for that yeah he does at some point talk about having to wage a continual war against the evil spirits in, in Isagog. Yes. So he he definitely still, you know, slipped in a little bit of his uh uh his concept of like, oh, we've got the good guys and the bad guys and we gotta we gotta beat right. all the bad guys. Um I'm still waiting for the movie of Isagog. I think it would make a pretty uh <laughs> interesting <laughs> <laughs> It would be just a uh, Castor and Pollux uh finishing up some magical ritual and then like taking bong hits on a couch. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> uh, 
All right, so after the Isagog, we have... I skipped the Heptameron. <laughs> I didn't reread really oh, the buddy. Heptameron. So do you want to oh. talk a little bit about what the Heptameron is and why it's so significant? I've read it in the past, we- and I don't remember why I skipped it this time. I think I was just excited about um, our other stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the, the, the first thing to know about uh, the Heptameron is that um, its its author, supposed author, is a guy by the name of Peter de Abenon who was a late, I think it's 13th century, early 14th century. He was a scholar. He was a physician. He was kind of one of those, you know, a pre-Renaissance man. And uh, he, he was attributed with writing this book. A lot of people said that he didn't write it. Uh, the first copy of the Heptameron, I think, came out in Venice in 1485. Dr. David Skinner, sorry, David Skinner, Dr. Stephen Skinner says that most likely the first kind of printed version of it came in 1310. And so he attributed it to Peter de Abano. The reason I would say that he probably wrote it and it's uh, Skinner's contention as well is that uh, he was, he was, tr- uh, he was put on trial twice by the Inquisition uh, <laughs> for, for doing these kind of things for, for dabbling in magic and diabolism. He died in prison uh, while awaiting trial the second time that he was imprisoned. A uh, very interesting story about him is that uh, he was, uh, he died and his friends broke in and stole his body and kind of hid it all over the place and then buried it in consecrated ground in an unmarked tomb. The church was kind of upset with this, so instead uh, they burned him in effigy because they need, they, people need the, the burning. Are, are you not entertained kind of thing? I don't know. Um, that sounds kind of like just, witchcraft. Yeah, a little bit. Well, yeah, a little bit. A little bit. <laughs> the church has never been one to uh, turn away from witchcraft. They just get to decide who's got the good witchcraft, uh, and that's always been the case. But yeah, Ga- uh, Georg don't... probably really enjoyed that part of the church. I'm sure. Oh yes, absolutely. <laughs> oh, there's a there's but, something there is. There, there, I I want to go back to uh, the Isagog just for a second because there is something in there that I took a lot of notes on that I was really uh, curious about, which is the, uh, the lying spirits that, that Gabriel talks spirit, about. Yes. Yeah. He, uh, he says that he, he, he puts a bunch of, um, uh, biblical references in there without actually, it, which is interesting because he doesn't actually quote the Bible. He just sticks references in, uh, which is definitely a sign of the times. It's, it's, you know, it's a hundred years after the first Bible had been printed. So people would actually have access to go read the Bible at this point. Um, but he talks about these, uh, these lying spirits being the spirits of tricksters who, uh, who are out to, um, seduce magicians in particular, (laughs) false magicians who don't know what they're doing. And they're called uh, vessels of death and vessels of fury and vessels of destruction. Um, (laughs) <laughs> which is interesting because this is after he talks about the subterranean spirits, uh, which he uh, uh, attributes lots of like magical effects to. So he definitely you know thinks that they're real, but he also says that that subterranean spirits pretend to be the souls of the dead, not that they yes. actually are. So even the subterranean spirits are sort of seen to be kind of tricksters, uh, and it's it's fascinating. You know, there's. The, this whole souls of the dead thing, um, which also is seeing like a lot of re, uh, resurgence now in in the occult, um, you know, people doing like ancestor worship and uh, and like if you if you read uh, uh, Ashen Chasson's um, records of his contact with spirits and how many of them claim to be the souls of the dead who were you know elevated to higher positions of authority or whatever, it's kind of fascinating to see that uh, you know back here in this particular grimoire those are called fake souls of the dead not real souls of the dead they're just sort of faking it yes i'll uh one of the more interesting things and i think another reason that wire said that the fourth book or specifically on magical ceremonies wasn't written by agrippa is the very last section of on magical ceremonies is on necromancy it's on it's, it's, it's on the dead where do you find the dead well, go to a graveyard, go to like, go to this kind of thing. So and you can just see why be like, what the fuck is this? Oh my God. They're going to dig him up and, and burn his body. Then there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and then the book ends. It's like, and here endeth on magical ceremonies. Yeah. Um, yeah. Necromancy is coming back in a big way. I, it's, it's one of those things that it's, it's my jam. Um, I, I love all aspects of magic, but as I've uh, 
kind of navigated through certain things. Um, I tend to right now, uh, might change, but I, my stuff is really towards, I, I do a lot of ancestor work. I do a lot of, um, uh, Greek magical papyri stuff, but, uh, I'd say that most of it is like Solomonic grimoire. My current, uh, jam is, uh, trying to find more information about something called the Thesaurus Spiritum. Uh, which is kind of it's kind of like a key of Solomon. It's not really a book, but it's a kind of book. Uh, specifically, things like De Necomantia, which is uh, attributed to Francis Bacon. But uh, but yeah, this this idea of the, the lying, the, the lying spirits, the trickster trickster spirits uh, that you read in Isagog. And <laughs> I, I do hold on, hold on. It and you, you had a, a hiccup there. If you, I oh, sorry about that. Um, I know that uh, if, if with the reading of the of Isagog and the idea of this trickster, trickster spirits and, and whatnot, you kind of can read with new light something like the George P. Hansen's book, The Trickster and the Paranormal, which is, for my money, maybe one of the best books and a book that I think everybody needs to read that's interested in the things that, uh, that I am. But uh, no, I, I really do. I really do love uh, <laughs> do love some of the just yeah. Uh, Billy Angus was kind of known as being, I, I think, of his time, a, a writer to compare him to. At least in the cult circles, would be Arthur Edward Waite. His he's a very prosaic writer, but for some reason in Isagog, yeah, the way that he describes demons, you can tell that he really hates them because he brings out his best vocabulary when he's talking about. Them. Oh yeah, he's so he's so. Uh animated about it he he yeah. just like the the words and the descriptions he uses are great it's that's and it and it's pretty much right after that part where he starts getting into his ghost stories so that's definitely yeah. a, a really good part of that the isagog okay sorry okay Absolutely. back to the hep tamarin <laughs> uh so, the hep tamarin. so peter de de abano uh was abano, yeah. uh, 13th century maybe yep. 14th century uh burned in effigy but this book that he had this book that he produced which has survived and uh, is is currently a, a fairly popular grimoire i mean people turn to that Extremely. frequently um you don't often see people referring to it in the context of the of the f bop <laughs> no but um uh but how does it fit into the rest how does it fit into the theme of this collection well, the reason I think that it is so wonderful uh, and why it is included in the fourth book is because of the fact that everything that Agrippa talks about in On Magical Ceremonies is kind of included. So if you if you see those things that I talked about, the, uh, the uh, consecration, invocation, constraint, the... Uh, the binding and the license to depart, those things are kind of included in the heptameron. So you can kind of flip back and forth to be like, okay, so this is where this fits. So this is where this fits. And so that way it's an extremely useful tool uh, to have uh, the heptameron. uh, Skinner includes it right after on magical ceremonies in his uh, translation of the fourth book of occult philosophy. And in this way, I think it's incredibly useful to see that, that, what Agrippa talked about is being used here in the hip tamarin, and you can kind of draw the difference, uh, not draw the difference. You can draw the conclusions and kind of come up with the ceremony itself. I think that, uh, yeah, the hip tamarin is, is one of those, it's, it could be very well be baby's first grimoire. Um, it's, <laughs> it's, I, I really love it due to the fact that, uh, for a lot of people that I know that are interested in magic, and they uh, they they either want to n- not even acknowledge the uh, the golden yawn bus, but uh, at least maybe work their way out of it to go towards grimoire based magic, which I'm all for. Which I, I think that again, I I, I go back to Jake Stride Camp. Like this actually is the Western magical tradition, at least uh, for for me, is that you can people are a bit hesitant because of the demons evil spirits you have at the very top of the hierarchy you have lucifer beelzebub and satan right the heptameron don't have those guys it's an angelic grimoire so you're dealing with spirits of the air you're dealing with angels the name heptameron literally means seven days in greek so Mm -hmm. you are doing different circles on the floor from which to protect yourself the circle changes depending on what season it is what day it is and what uh, 
what hour you you want to do these these conjurations, uh, just like in what Agrippa wrote in on magical ceremonies. It's all there and it's all laid out. the The reason I call it Babies for his Grimoire is because if you are scared of demons and whatnot, the kind of more uh, shall we shall we say um, uh, nefarious sides of Grimoire, this is the book to go to. The Heptameron. This is the Grimoire to go to. Because in some ways, you're not really in other grimoires. You kind of have you, you kind of have to do some uh, some demon bullying, and you kind of you have to force them, and you're kind of cruel to them. In the Heptameron, when you do your first um, invocation, it's like welcome spirits. Here you are, great spirits. It's really quite welcoming and quite glad, and it's it's not that terrifying. You're you're kind of like bros what's up how's it going let's let, let's let's do this magic stuff which i think is an incredible thing so for those interested in um interested in grimoire magic the fourth book is maybe the one that i will that are people that are kind of like i don't like demons i don't like demons it's like <laughs> you should probably maybe try the fourth book because not only does it set things up for you you have a working grimoire there and my experiences with the Heptameron, they, they were quite fruitful. I haven't done any in the last little while. Every once in a while, I'll change things up. I do uh, daily planetary prayers. I'll use the planetary prayers in the Heptameron. Uh, they're, they're quite great. But the working that I did do with the Heptameron, I was, uh, I was working with uh, a Samael, which is uh, on Tuesday, it's Mars. People normally equate you know, Mars with this death and destruction and all that kind of stuff. But, mm-hmm. um, planetary, the, uh, uh, Mars is my time Lord. Uh, I, I tend to get along with Mars, uh, and, and, uh, uh, Mars based spirits quite well. And, uh, it's, it's very effective. It's the reason the Heptameron is great is because it also leaves room just like in on magical ceremonies for you to kind of free will. And, and it's, it's almost like jazz. You're kind of figuring out what works and, and whatnot. And so uh, that's why I think that the Heptameron is, is a really great way to try and get into grimoire magic. And I would suggest it for nearly everyone. Do I use it quite constantly? No, I had a period of about four months where I was using it and it was really quite fun and uh, it works. It, it really does work. But uh, yeah, the, the, I like the fact that it has specifically with Skinner's translation that it has on magical ceremonies and then it has the heptameron. You can kind of go back in between them and see how everything fits together. And in that respect is an incredibly useful book to have in the, uh, the fourth book. Yeah. And interestingly enough, uh, I guess this just occurred to me, but that kind of like that planetary days of the week kind of theme runs throughout, right? So you have it sort of popping mm-hmm. up in a grip in the, in the first book, in the first section on magical ceremonies. It continues through the Heptameron, which also has a lot of, uh, signs and seals for the various planetary angels, which almost look okay. like they were made using Agrippa's method. Um, yeah. 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 But then you get into, uh, the Arbitel which is also um, planetary magic and really, really friendly stuff. Like the Arbitel spirits yeah. are, you know, the everything in the Arbitel, it's even more stripped down and more simple than Agrippa's stuff. So by the time you get to the Arbitel, you're, you're, it's basically like, here's a prayer, use it or not, just, you know, call yeah. out to these <laughs> things, be really friendly, say hi, they'll show up. Um, yeah. And it's really, uh, you know, you... you uh, it's it's it is definitely the most relaxed of grimoires, and this which is great, yeah. And honestly, this, this style of uh, spirit work is is what I do. Like, I don't want to go mm-hmm. through, I don't want a lion skin belt. No, I mean, <laughs> where would I keep it? <laughs> um, so, so yeah, that's that's uh, that's an interesting sort of take on it. Is that it's just sort of like a pleasant beginner's grimoire. Uh, but even then, like you don't, you don't necessarily need to go full lesser key goetic stuff to deal with demons and lesser creatures. And in fact, no. I would almost say don't. You know, th- <laughs> I I I kind of have a problem with the goetic stuff. Like I think it's cool. I think that you know the the seals are cool. Some of the stuff is cool, but a lot of it is is kind of this like. Uh, I don't want to use these words. I don't want to call it colonialization, but it's it's mm. it's Christian magicians turning spirits into bad guys, right? 
you know, it, it really treats them hostily. It really sort of is saying things like, and, and honestly, some of those spirits and some of the spirit names came from uh, earlier cultures and, and were, you know, worshipped as gods and, and used as deities in other cultures. But it's like, you know, you can't be a, you can't be a Catholic wizard uh, and acknowledge that, like, Baal is a god. Right, right. <laughs> um, and so for that reason, like, a lot of the Goetic stuff kind of, it really rubs me the wrong way. It really rubs me as sort of, like, very disrespectful and um, uh, and sort of uh, a, a an overly um, terrified reaction to uh, other spirits and other powers that might be out there. And, you know, in right. particular, you know, you know, when you go back to like the PGM, you work with gods that are sometimes not excited to work with you or sometimes sort of even hostile. And they require a lot of badgering and a lot of like, Hey, get over here and help me sort of stuff. You know, you, you, so, so that There's sort a lot of, tradition, of God bullying happening. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Uh, so, so that tradition of sort of like sometimes really having to cajole and almost bribe, spirits into helping you is is old and it doesn't necessarily mean that they're evil it just means that they probably have something better to do than to listen to some whiny little wizard <laughs> <laughs> i tried to say that in the whiniest possible voice but this roadcaster pro makes me sound really serious all the time i got it though eric i got it. i got i got the wine there <laughs> all right <Whew. laughs> i uh i have a thing because a lot of people um they they will say specifically the ones that better emailing me because they'll email also like, Hey, I would prefer to use the Urgua, sorry, the Urgia Goetia than the Ars Goetia uh, because it also seems a bit more friendly and kind of what you brought up with you know, the, the, the idea of colonialization or Christianization of, of demons. Um, there's what's strange about the, uh, the Heptameron is although it was produced in about 1310, most likely uh, there's, definite idea that it was the the things put forward in it came from way before we find copies of the heptameron that were bound with copies of the higromantia mm. which for my money i don't know if people uh, I've, I've talked about it on my program but for me the higromantia is maybe the greatest grimoire that you can work with um and you so you see a tradition of uh of being able to connect the dots through Byzantium and that wonderful melting pot of absolutely everything. And that was magic. You have uh, scholastic image magic coming from there. You have got the, uh, the Solomonic magic. You've got almost great astrology, almost everything coming through there. Uh, the, the God bullying and the, that, that kind of thing, uh, and the using the name of, of somewhat, I guess, uh, Stygian, Stygian demons and stuff like that. It's it's one of those things where I I kind of see how it came to be that way. And for people that are basically being like, well, I don't like the word Jesus Christ, or I'm just going to put in instead of using Jesus Christ, I'll put in the word uh, Ganesha because I like Ganesha and this kind of thing. I see it because I come from a very spirit based model and based on all of the magic that I do. I, I see it as a way of people putting their beliefs before that of the spirit's ecosystem and what they reacted to and how they've chosen to appear and those kind of things. Um, I don't, if you get better at grimoire based magic and specifically the, the Goetia, um, if you get really good at it, it doesn't require you to, again, with the whole, uh, on magical ceremonies, if, if you get good at it, there's less bullying involved and it actually becomes a bit more of a partnership. And the, the forms in which wire and Reginald Scott talked about how the demons appear, um, very, very few times have they ever appeared to me visually as the things that they've described. Most of the times they look almost and talk almost exactly like the spirits from the heptameron. Um, I've never worked the Arbitel and, uh, I would think I would be interested in doing it. There was a wonderful uh, series of essays that uh, Frater Asher had on his blog, Theomagica, in which he kind of did the uh, the whole jazz grimoire thing, in which he did his own ceremony to jazz summon grimoire. the Olympic spirits. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and it, it, it's very it's very great. Um, it's wonderful reading. Oh, someday I'll get to it, but um, I just see the if for me it was one of those things where. 
uh, I want to see how the spirits respond to the way that it was written as a kind of passage through history, specifically with things like the Higromantia and the Heptameron, which are definitely older. The, the shape of them is much older than they appear in the manuscripts that we have. So, mm-hmm. de- so basically, I think that um, to get back to the, the main thing about uh, the the Goetia and the use of demons, um, there's there's plenty of really great resources to, to go to. One of them is uh, Joseph Lazuski's. He's got a book called uh, Ser- uh, I think it's called Ceremonial Magic, and it's a new Falcon book. It's it's got some stuff in it that I really dislike, but a lot of a lot of things that he he really does nail. Um, the slingshot effect, I've never had any problems with that, but uh, I do. I do think as far as, as Grimoire magic is concerned, if the idea of working with repulsive spirits or Christianized demons and stuff like that is not really your jam and you come at it from a, a praxis point of you've gone through the Kabbalah, you've maybe cracked open the Sefer Yatsara, those kind of things, then the Heptameron is maybe the book to go to the, the Grimoire. It's, it's the, uh, it's the gateway Grimoire to, to go through. And for that, I, I think it's a really, great book well I think I'm going to have to check it out again I think um, Rufus Opus's work is pretty heavily based on the Heptameron I believe yeah Yeah. so I guess I have probably done a little bit of Heptameron stuff since I've worked some of uh, Seven Spheres but I've also I have worked with the Arbitel spirits and they oh you have yeah they have been the easiest and most effective, I guess. I've combined sort of like Arbitel stuff with Picatrix stuff, nice. which has been kind of interesting. Uh, but I do want to talk about. I'm going to go even further back. I didn't. Um, I didn't take note of this when I was like writing down things to talk about. I just found it again today when I was flipping through the book and I had underlined it in the book itself. Uh, back in on uh, back in the uh, the uh, magical of magical ceremonies. When Agrippa talks about the laman that you're supposed to wear when you're doing spirit work, he actually says uh, to make the laman under a fortunate star, and yeah. it will be more effective. And this is um, this is something that like Skinner doesn't spend a whole lot of time on this, but uh, but he wouldn't have anyhow because when he did this editing and released his book, it was before astrological magic really had its big resurgence. Um, and this is something where I think uh, Agrippa is kind of getting a, a new um, examination through people like uh, Warnock and Greer. But uh, astrological magic is an integral part of Agrippa's whole system. So com- mm-hmm. so the fact that he's combining astrological magic with this whole uh, right for calling forth spirits is, um, is, I think, really interesting to me and also indicates that perhaps it's not just... You know, it's not just the planetary days and hours that are going to be important. Um, and something that grimoire magicians should probably be taking heed of is that they're going to have to learn astrological magic and how to calculate elections at some point in order to get the the most good out of their work. Um, I, it- I only do magic when astrologically things are very, very fortuitous and and good um the well then i'm you're, you're gonna have a really boring year <laughs> you truth be told i've been going through uh, i i use the uh, i use the hagromantia again that's my my go-to um the thing that it shares with the have tavern is definitely has the hours of the day and the angels of the hour kind of thing uh again mm-hmm. that isn't influence um I'm going through the Heptameron this year, it's just kind of like, there's not a lot of years to do really good, a lot of days to do really good magic. Uh, most of the Grimoire stuff that I do, uh, we're working with sublunar spirits. I'm less so much, I don't do so much planetary magic. I find it easier to work with sublunar spirits. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, just going through this year, it's <laughs> it's not looking the best for, for Grimoires. But then I'll, I'll branch off and, and do some more, uh, some more other work. I think I... I think uh, heading back to the the PGM might be in the cards for me a bit this uh, this year, but um, I yeah. spent a, a, a couple series of years uh, working mainly with the, uh, the PGM. So who knows? But uh, yeah, I, I do love the fact that uh, that the Heptameron does have the the planetary days there and uh, the uh, the planetary hours, uh, the seasons, even and Grimoire magicians. If you are not utilizing the the planets and the stars and where things are, you are missing out. 
The, absolutely. To not use them, to not use them is absolute lunacy. Uh, uh-huh. um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but it, it, it's one of those things like just, it's that secret spice. It really is what it is. You add that secret spice and your efficacy with trying to contact these beings, whether visually or audibly or through uh, crystals, through shoe stones, through any of this kind of stuff, divining vessels, uh, that kind of thing. Trust me, if you do it on a day where everything's going right, the planetary day matches the the, the lunar uh, the lunar cycle, the uh, the sort of the lunar day, then just trust me, you just have to do it. You yeah, really do. You need to learn this. Worth, stuff. Yeah, it's definitely worth experimenting with and and trying out. Uh, okay, so we've covered uh, the first three books pretty well. That's the. Uh, the magical ceremonies book, um, the Isag- the Heptameron, the Isagog. So let's dig into the Arbitel a little bit more. Uh, I've Absolutely. got I I I really like the Arbitel, and one of the things that I like about it is that um, it spends a lot of time not only outlining sort of like its own philosophy of magic, like it splits magic up into different categories. Uh, right. And in different parts of the book, it splits them up into different kinds of categories, which is totally not confusing at all. Thanks, Arbitel. Um, <laughs> but uh, but it also talks about like here's how you need to be. Like this is you know being a magician isn't about just uh, contact contacting spirits and making amulets and magic spells and all that kind of stuff. The Arbitel outlines stuff like you need to be. Um, pure of soul. You need to be working on your own virtue and your own sort of like um, uh, righteousness, you know, which is mm-hmm. um, which is a which is a theme that you see a lot dating back. You know, it, it sort of gets echoed through all sorts of different um, traditions, including stuff like you know the Sefer Yetzirah and, and Kabbalah. Um, but I really, really like that that part of the Arbitel. It's got a whole set of aphorisms that sort of talk. They're all about, yeah, it's all yeah. aphorisms, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then, um, and then it's got these interesting little secrets that you don't really see people talking about very much. But I would really, uh, I, I hope that anybody who goes into the Arbitel workings pays attention to the first is that the Olympic spirits, which is what the Arbitel deals with. The, the, the Olympic spirits are kind of like um, they're they're like planetary spirits, maybe on the same order or of the same sort of caliber as like planetary archangels or something of that nature, but. Uh, it says really plainly in the book, none of these names are right. Huh. Like you, you're you, these names are right, you yeah. know the name of a spirit, the name of an Olympic spirit is only good for forty years, which is probably shorthand right. for saying like each magician who contacts the spirit is going to get a different reply. You know, right. you're going huh. to have a different spirit. Uh, I don't know if it's saying that it's the same spirit with a different name or that you get your own spirit when you contact the Olympic spirits, but it talks about sort of like, you know, call these spirits by their titles and not by their names. Um, you and it, and it almost, you know, my experience with them is that you not only get like a name, but you get like your own seal to use. Hmm. You basically get to build your own little black book of planetary spirits to work with. And luckily, Agrippa's got in magical ceremonies a way of coming up with spirit names. So, well, yeah, and you, you know. can perhaps use that. Uh, I haven't experimented with that, but that might be something that you could do, especially if you have trouble making contact with them uh, by right, yeah. d- doing that in particular. Um, and then uh, you sometimes see people talking about how the Arbitel doesn't actually have instructions for calling spirits. But there is a little bit. It's really, really light instruction. It's really sort of like here's a suggested prayer or two and here's a suggested way you can do it and it's perhaps like maybe just two or three paragraphs but it's totally worth looking at it's you know the the heptameron is stricter uh than the arbitel but both of them along with agrippa's instructions sort of really show that there's far more free form there's a far more free form approach to um to working with some of this grimoire stuff than than then grimoire purists would have you think. I mean, if you're going to be a right. grimoire purist, why can't you be a, an FBOP purist? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I really like that. I, I get, again, it's it's one of those things where I'm at. Uh, I'm kind of at a loss because I have not worked with the Olympic experience. My my only 
kind of uh, research on it besides actually reading the Arbitel itself. I, d- I don't have a copy of Joseph uh, H. Peterson's Arbitel. I've heard it's very good. It but, is. Uh, it's, it's, it's a facing page translation. Okay, amazing. That's, yeah, so it is known it is for really that good. stuff. Yeah. But, but uh, I know that Freder Asher and Josephine McCarthy uh, did a lot of work with the Arbitel, and they were just like, hey, guess what? There would be some powerful magic here, and I think that the Arbitel needs to get it to do. Mm, um, I, I, I agree. Would, I, would, I would love to do some work with the Arbitel, I think. Uh, maybe uh, 2016 might also, or sorry, 2020 might be uh, might be the year for that. <laughs> Wait, is, is but, Canada uh, yeah. using a different calendar still? <laughs> We're 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 always we're always four years behind. Um, when you guys get ramen bars down in the U.S., it took another four years for us to get them up here. Uh, whatever big culinary thing you have down there is going to take another four years. Uh, so wait, are you guys still wearing parachute pants? Uh, no, no, but we're we're still wearing the glasses without lenses in them. Oh, <laughs> uh, Canadian hipsters. Yeah, the the best. <laughs> oh, so the 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 bit about calling the spirits is a. Uh, Aphorism 17 in the Arbitel, where it really says, uh, the spirits are to be called simply. Use their name, their office, or their character. And the character of the spirit is... um, uh, so, so it gives examples, right? So each of the seven spirits has a character. But then the description it gives is that the character is given or confirmed. So it's almost sort of... Which, which, which is interesting to go back and see because that's the experience that I had is that I was given a different character to use when calling okay. the spirits that I contacted. So that's uh, that's worth paying attention to. There, so, no, the, so there's some there's some close reading in the Arbitel that gives that sort of is saying to you like you're going to have a different experience than anybody else. Uh, right. So again, you're going to have to. You know, pay attention to some of that stuff in the Isagog about like who the hell knows what's going on. Try it out and see what works. Right. Just make sure that you're not calling up any trickster spirits. Those things, Those, they're they're everywhere. But uh, <laughs> no, it, the Arbitel has been for a long period of time kind of shat upon, specifically by guys like Stephen Skinner. It's, he's not totally cool about it, but he just kind of, I think, in his '78 introduction to the book, uh, the fourth book, he just kind of like. And then there's this one with these really drawn up, like drawn out aphorisms. It's called the Arbitel of Magic. Let's talk about geomancy, kind of thing. Like he yeah. really does do that. <laughs> but if you if you listen to um, Stephen Skinner's uh, interviews now, like if you listen to him on the on Glitch Bottle and stuff like that, he's 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 a very very strict purist when it comes to the grimoires. Very much so. And he yeah. really is sort of like if you want to make sure that you're getting you know, authentic results and having authentic stuff happen, you have to follow everything to the letter. So the fact that the Arbitel doesn't give you any letters to really follow is going to, is going to not fit into his particular uh, grimoire approach. Exactly. Um, exactly yeah. But, uh, you know, magicians should take note that this whole idea that you have to follow everything to the letter is something that maybe came along in the 19th century with the golden dawn or the golden yawn, <laughs> I like that. <laughs> uh, but it was it was th- it was thrown out in the in the early twentieth century when you started to have chaos magic and Austin Osmond spare and all that kind of stuff. Like people were just sort of like, nope, let's just do our own thing. And it's really kind of it's it's a, it's one of those tugs of war where the popular approach to magic seems to be waffling back and forth between make it all up or follow everything as strictly as possible. So right. so it's worth I experimenting. Kinda- I kind of fall in the middle more towards the, uh, maybe one of my favorite books about uh, working grimoires is a book called Magister Officiorum by Julio Cesar Odi. And he's somewhat of a, he's somewhat of a purist, but he's also kind of like there, there is room to be able to adapt. Uh, his, his circle that he uses uh, in Magister Officiorum is from, uh, I think it's, um, De Sept, uh, De Sept Spirit is, uh, Planet, Man, I'm butchering it. I'm absolutely butchering. Anyways, it's okay. to it's say, okay. everybody knows it's Canadians kind of, can't speak Latin. Oh, but oh, it's terrible. <laughs> well, it was French, so we should be able to speak it. Yeah, I thought everybody <laughs> up there spoke French. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, but uh, but he uses like he does not use a goetic circle. He uses a circle that's more akin to something like that. It's planet. It's a planetary circle. It's more akin to that something like out of the heptameron. 
Mm-hmm. So that's kind of that's kind of where I think people should try to land. It's like don't just go in there using your own gods and using your own words. The words are there specifically. Mind the ecosystem that the spirit responds to, but also you can have some fun with it. You can have ways of trying to adapt. What the grimoire what grimoire tradition does exist is not a living tradition, but it is one of constant rediscovery. And that's what Stephen Skinner has said. And mm-hmm. rediscovery means being able to tinker with things, to copy things down, put them in your Libra Spiritum. Perhaps somebody will find that Libra Spiritum later on, and then they'll be able to, to adapt to it. That is the true grimoire tradition. And I think it people is. really need to really need to, you know, to catch on to this. And because that is, at bottom, the point of being a grimoire magician is that it's constant adaptation. And it is a, a, a tradition of rediscovery of what works and what doesn't. So, oh, absolutely. That, no. Wait. Okay. Let's let's go back to the Libra Spiritum again, too. Mm-hmm. I, I really, mm-hmm. really love. I, I I I don't know why I didn't consider that section when I read the fourth book the first time. Probably because it was a long time ago and I wasn't really doing any spirit work. But yeah. um, <laughs> but uh, I don't know if you're if you pay attention to like Instagram, which is. But Instagram, Instagram which is, there are lots of witches no. on Instagram, and a oh. really big trend amongst uh, witches, in particular, as far as I know, Instagram witches is sort of the creation of their own grimoire, right? So book of shadows, book of, book of shadows, or or grimoire. they're calling them grimoires, but they're basically books of shadow. Right. Um, yeah, okay. Great. So so you know they they have these. It's basically like occult scrapbooking. You know they they make these beautiful pieces of art where they they illustrate the pages and they make all of their charts and they do all of their things i would really like to see i don't think you should be putting pictures of your your liber spiritum online but i would really yeah. like to at least hear about more uh more magicians making uh libre spiritum and sharing them or or, or at least a- not not sharing them but like sharing their methods and sharing what's worked and what hasn't because agrippa gives this uh this sense in his description of the of the Liber Spiritum that uh, it almost acts as a talisman itself. Like you can then use the 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 stuff that you've done in the Liber Spiritum to immediately call the spirit to your aid or to to help. Right where it's kind of absolutely it's kind of like a shortcut sort of thing. Exactly. Once you've done the binding. The Libra Spiritum is there to also be able to allow you to kind of get that shortcut. Like that, that's, it's a heuristic to be able to contact the spirits, which is an incredibly um, wonderful thing. The Libra Spiritum is also there to sometimes if you want to, in that segment of your, your process of invocation or evocation is sometimes you'll have a piece of paper there and just say like show yourself on the page kind of thing and we're not Mm -hmm. talking about like (laughs) a pen just picking up and that's never happened to me I don't know of anybody that has had that happen but I have had my Libra Spiritum open and then days later something very strange happens to it (laughs) um, uh, to that specific page but um I've never shown my friend. I've got about four Libra Spiritums. They're, they tend to be somewhat Grimoire specific. If the Grimoires are quite close, because I know that when I was doing my Heptameron stuff, uh, I was also doing stuff with the Hagromantia. And, and so those two were kind of combined. But the, the idea of having a Libra Spiritum, I've, I've said before on my podcast, having a magical journal, you need to have one. Uh, I would suggest if you're working Grimoires, you get your own Libra Spiritum, create your own story. Um, yeah, I think I the, don't know. the magical journal and the Libra Spiritum, I think, should be two different things. Absolutely. Because the Libra Keep Spiritum should be, because the, although uh, Agrippa also kind of makes it clear that the Libra Spiritum is almost kind of like a call log. You know, you'll turn to the page for that spirit, you'll work yeah. with the spirit, you'll record the exact, you know, astro weather and time and, and, and results, like, on the pages for that spirit. Um, so it I think also, that that's it, important. It also helps with memorization. Uh, I'm not one of those guys that thinks that you should have all of the, the invocation memorized, but if you do, it does help. Um, any effort that you put in, the spirits like that. Spirits, I don't know if I have time to talk too much in this episode, but it's kind of one of the things that I've always been really uh, big on is that the universe, to my understanding, seems to run on some kind of narrative or story-based function. 
And the more gravity or story you have while doing your spells, I know people hate that word, but I, I actually enjoy it. The more the spirits respond to that by giving them their own book, you're giving them their own story, the story of you working with them and they will respond. They really, really will. So uh, Libra Spiritum is an essential it's as essential as having a circle uh, when you're doing spirit work. Um, that's, specifically grim work I think that's, that's work. good advice. That's good advice. Yeah. Well, you know, we've been talking about, uh, about the FBOP for a while now, and um, we haven't really touched on the geomancy bit at all, but I'm kind of okay with that because... You know, truth be told, Eric, I was kind of uh, very scared <laughs> because I know nothing. About well, okay, I don't know nothing. I I know a little bit about uh, about um, geomancy, <laughs> but it's uh, yeah, it's, it's not my thing. It's it's, it's, it's uh, kind of outside my wheelhouse, also. And honestly, oh, like if if we if you if if the audience wants to learn about geomancy, there are some pretty good uh, sources out there. And maybe and Walk, I think you I'll interviewed just, on. I, I on interviewed my, him about something yeah. else, but I oh, okay. I'll interview him about geomancy, and we'll get Sam Block on here, and we'll have him talk about geomancy and hear what Please he says. Do. He doesn't. Yeah. Okay. So anyhow, Douglas, <laughs> this has been this has given me a ton of stuff to think about. I hope that it's given the audience a lot of stuff to think about. I hope that we've given the audience a lot of things to um, to experiment and try out. Like this, hopefully, will encourage more people to work with the with Agrippa's fourth book of occult philosophy and maybe get people looking into alternate views on spirits and working with spirits and, you know, crack some minds open. Like, you don't need to latch on to the dogma about this stuff. You should be experimenting and figuring it out for yourself. Uh, Absolutely. Which, I, that's sort of the main message of Agrippa, I think. I think... Um if we look historically, if I can just uh, jump in here for a quick second, if we look historically, there, as I mentioned maybe a bit earlier, uh, I might have been before when the microphones were turned on, we have more evidence for the fact that the fourth book was copied and made more than the three books of occult philosophy. This is mainly due to the fact that in, I believe it was 1584, a book called The Discovery of Witchcraft by Reginald Scott was released. In England specifically, those two books, the fourth book of occult philosophy and discovery of witchcraft caused an incredible surge of magic within England that has probably never been, the fourth book was such a huge book. There was a pamphlet that was released after, I believe it was the second publication of Robert Turner's 1655 translation of the fourth book, where it was basically calling people that, that have this book. Uh, what are the words? Um, star wizards, uh, piss prophets, and astrologers. They, there's, <laughs> uh, there's other, there's other people. Yeah, there's other people that have um, have. Uh, uh, I, I forget which writer it was, but he basically said like, "Oh, if you go to your friend's place and they have a copy of the fourth book open, make sure that it's for amusement purposes only." Kind of thing. This was. There, there's more evidence that this book had a larger impact, uh, specifically in England and amongst the regular folks doing magic, than the three books did, which is an incredible legacy that needs to be rediscovered about the fourth book, and which is why I find it, why I go to it more than the three books. Three books is wonderful. It's It's got everything you kind of need, but it also has this necessary distance. The the fourth book, it jumps right in there and it, it wants you to do magic, which is what I'm all for. That is the point of my podcast is I want people to do this stuff to see, holy crap, there's actually something else here. Yeah, there's get out of the armchair. to this magic thing. <laughs> yes, yeah. Well, truth be told, I don't have a problem with armchair magicians. Theory in itself is a form of practice, so I get it, but I really want people to see that. The reason that people are writing about this kind of stuff is because it's real <laughs> is because that if you start worrying with spirits, you come to a very quick understanding that this shit is in some, it's some, it somehow works and it is real in some strange sense on some kind of crazy spectrum. You will get results and it is mind blowing and your axioms for how you view the world have to change, oh, which absolutely. is a, a wonderful thing. It yeah. is. All right, Douglas, why don't you tell the audience where they can find you on the internet? 
Um, you can head to whatmagicisthis.com. There I've got a bunch of, it's, it's mainly a podcast website, so it's not huge. I don't have spells up there. I don't have this kind of stuff. But I, for my individual episodes that I release about once every 10 days, uh, I'm two days late on the newest one because uh, one of my guests, decided to flake out on me because they it, think it, that it happens, I'm it evil. Happens. Yeah, anyways. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I promise you the next episode is going to be an absolute banger. Uh, I'm not going to reveal what it's going to be about, but it's going to be about one of my favorite things in the world. Oh, that's but, good. Uh, oh, on chocolate. My, on, oh, well, <laughs> one of my favorite magical things, uh, oh. magical chocolate. <laughs> but, uh, but one thing that I'm kind of known for, if I'm known at all, uh, maybe I'm kind of give myself a bit more than I deserve, but uh, I do some ridiculously uh, expensive uh, links to show notes. Uh, I, I spend, I spend hours going through things that I'm not just going to Wikipedia and, and clicking on uh, a thing there and linking to it. I, I do scour the internet for the best information about the topics that I'm talking about. So you'll get some ridiculous book recommendations there uh, on my website uh, you can find my podcast. It's on if if anybody's got podcasts, it's going to be there. My Twitter is up on there, as is my Instagram. I'm getting better at Instagram. Uh, I'm getting better at Twitter. Again, I was off the map as far as social media is concerned. Um, yeah, it's just one of those things I'm not totally interested in. So I'm getting better at it. But if you want any of that kind of stuff, head to whatmagicisthis.com. Uh, please enjoy it. I'm, I'm going to start doing some tinkering with the website. In fact, I've already started. I was doing that today. Um, but uh, uh, the, the episode, the podcast themselves, the episodes are very topic-based. Yeah. There's no, you can, you can jump in at any point. Uh, it's almost, and they're, they're almost you, uh, in the format of like a reverse interview, which I, I really yes. like. Yeah. All right. Well, thank I, you. I, consi- <laughs> Thanks, I consider it kind of sitting in on a, a tutoring session, um, basically, is what it is. <laughs> yeah. As All right. As that sound. Well, uh, thanks for joining me, and uh, I'll definitely have you on again, uh, maybe after we read some more books on geomancy. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> Eric, this has been an absolute pleasure. Uh, thank you for being one of the uh, one of the first people to reach out to me within the magical online magical community. Uh, your support has always been very wonderful and very uh, very kind, very warm. And no, I okay, still come to you. I don't. You don't need to like pepper me with compliments now that you're actually on the podcast. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm Canadian. This is just what we do. We're actually nice okay, people. Okay, we don't all right. do that, I so believe you. <laughs> I'm going to totally do the thing where like fade out and play the outro music now, though. So, <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Arnamancy podcast. You can find me online at arnamancy.com, where you can schedule a tarot reading or peruse the Arnamancy blog. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, or your favorite podcatcher. If you like this podcast, support it for just $1 a month through Patreon at patreon.com slash arnamancy.